A, a very good evening to everybody and uh, welcome to our uh, special uh, webinar on the occasion of uh, the eve of World Down Syndrome Day. We know that uh, every year uh, we uh, uh, dedicate the 20th of March, uh, the 21st of March to World Down Syndrome Day. And it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome all our attendees and our entire society, now over 4,000 members, to our special uh, Down uh, Syndrome Day uh, program. And um, along with Dr. Bimal Sani, welcome to the webinar we're going to have this evening. For those of you who are our new members, and we have a whole lot in the last three months, I want to remind you that we are a multidisciplinary organization that envisions offering every fetus an optimal outcome and our mission is to open minds to fetal needs. And Down syndrome fits exactly into this. We must understand that the world has shifted from uh, a situation where everybody uh, was trying to look for the perfect child to now realize that there is no such thing as a perfect or an imperfect child, that everybody has a place in life. And therefore, it was our question to open minds to these things and also to make sure that termination is not the end of all abnormalities. And Down syndrome is one of our best representative situations. And so we will take you through a lot of this uh, today. And for uh, those of you who don't have a scientific background and have also joined us either via YouTube or on Facebook, may I tell you that Down syndrome occurs when a person has three rather than two copies of chromosome 21. It is the commonest congenital cause of mental disability, congenital meaning that it is present at birth. It can lead to considerable ill health, although some individuals have only mild problems and can lead relatively normal lives. There's no doubt that in most parts of the world, parents and family will confess to the fact that having a baby with Down syndrome is likely to have a significant impact on family life. And yet there is still no known cure for this condition. A large number of parents would opt for terminating such a pregnancy and not carrying on and actually have demanded from the scientists of the world that we give them choices. On the other hand, there would be a, also a number that would quite happily have a personal decision or, a, uh, or any other reason for carrying on with such a pregnancy, for having the baby, and for very happily bringing up such a baby in spite of the odds and in spite of the fact that social acceptance is not universal. For these people, it would be very useful to prepare for such a baby. And therefore, even if they do not wish to not continue with the pregnancy, they might request for trying to diagnose Down syndrome during the pregnancy. And the good news is that Down syndrome can be diagnosed during pregnancy. We do understand that, yes, when it comes to this uh, condition, uh, it's been described a long, long, long time ago. And the first description that we got was from John Langdon Down. Uh, unfortunately, the words that he used were rather harsh. But the fact remains is that what he was trying to do was use a language that was available at that time. And he talked in 1866 of observations on an ethnic classification of idiots. We've come a long way since then, A, because the word idiot has changed in the English language and is no longer a positive word. And so we go by his description rather than his name uh, of calling them idiots. And we believe that yes, they're individuals who are different, that they're differently abled, and they're characterized by a very characteristic faces where the face is flat, the nose is small, and the skin is deficient in elasticity, giving the impression of being too large for the body. And interestingly, even today, this is what we look for when we're trying to make an attempt to screen and diagnose Down syndrome during pregnancy. The fact that it is a genetic disorder which means it arises from the genetic material of the individual, was first described by Jeremy Leyun in, um, in, in the 1900s. And in 1959, he told us that Down syndrome is due to three 
21 chromosomes. And the main reason was a non-disjunction. Later on, science has gone on to describe the fact that you also have the translocation type. And we will discuss that also uh, today during our, our panel discussion. But the important thing to realize is that yes, we attempt to diagnose during pregnancy. If we use a diagnostic test, which is we introduce um, needles to either obtain chorion villus or amniotic fluid, there is an inherent miscarriage rate, however, very small. But the other fact is that these tests are expensive and cannot be applied in any part of the world, uh, uh, irrespective of how rich those economies are for every pregnancy. And therefore, screening tests have come into place and these identify most of the patients who would benefit from further testing to uh, actually diagnose Down syndrome. And this would reduce risks and this would reduce costs. By definition, of course, screening tests will not identify all affected pregnancies. And the other important thing to remember is that a screening between uh, 11 to 14 weeks of pregnancy is far more effective than screening uh, in the uh, second trimester, which is from 16 to 24 weeks of gestation. We will realize that uh, Down syndrome is important antenatal care because it has a reasonably high incidence at birth, about one in 1,000 every live births. And uh, we do understand that if, if we take just pregnancies, the incidence is a little higher at about between one in 600 to 850 pregnancies. There are quality of life issues, some of which will be completely acceptable to some families, and some of which will not be acceptable to some families. And therefore we have to give families an option for deciding on inclusion and to give families an option of deciding on exclusion. And both these are equally important in today's age because of the peculiar situation that we have put ourselves on this planet. These babies do have a long lifespan and therefore would need care of various types. Some would be fairly independent and some would be fairly dependent and it is our duty to take care of them uh, once we have such a child uh, born to us. But it is equally important for you and me to realize that we do need to give patients an option on what they would like to do. And we exercise the extent of that option um, depending on what the parents want. And therefore, we will discuss a lot of this during the course of our panel discussion. Do remember that some patients would want direct invasive testing that means they want a direct result without going for screening, which is an indirect test. And therefore, uh, they would not require the screening aspects. And we will discuss screening during our panel discussion. And then there would be people who will not terminate for either religious or personal reasons. And therefore, they would not require genetic screening or diagnosis at all. We've come a long way since we started many years ago. And in the 80s, we used to have just a maternal risk, which was replaced by a second trimester screening, which then went on to a first trimester screening. And then ultrasound started playing a big role in the 80s and the 90s. So today, we have a combination of biochemistry and ultrasound. We also have a newer test, new in the sense it's about now 12 to 13 years old, which originated in China. And uh, it's a test where maternal blood can be used to detect uh, uh, cell-free fetal DNA. And this can be analyzed to try and tell which babies have Down syndrome or not. It overcomes the risks of invasive testing for the diagnosis of Down syndrome. But do remember that it's a screening test and Colonel Rima and the panel will discuss that as well. The descriptions are fairly old. And uh, we realized that Bera Benasarov and uh, told us about abnormal ultrasound scans in 1987. And Kipros Nicolaidis, went on to first describe a first trimester diagnosis at 12 to 13 weeks in 1992. And it took almost five to seven years after that to make, the, uh, make it perfect. And we now use a combination as we will learn later in this uh, webinar. We've come a long way to identify that back of the neck business. We in fact have images, this is an ultrasound image and not uh, an abortus image. And this on the bottom left, is what we uh, remember as Kipros Nicolaidis's first description that babies with Down syndrome will have extra fluid at the back of the neck. And then we made that into a sophisticated form of what is now known as the nuchal translucency and uh, imagery as you see here, which we will discuss later in the evening today. 
we do understand that the maternal uh, blood uh, free DNA, uh, cell free fetal DNA is emerging as a test, but uh, the fact that it cannot really be done uh, without knowing a fetal fraction for which we will require a 12 week scan. But importantly, as you will learn today, a first trimester screen is far more accurate than a second trimester screen. In the Asian scene and in many parts of the developing world, we have suboptimal imaging, unreliable biochemistry, a rush to terminate, and a confusion of how best to use cell-free fetal DNA. And we hope to give you clarity during the course of the evening today. NIPT seems to work well, but fails in a few tests. It continues to be relatively expensive, although I'm very pleased to announce that with the efforts of the Society of Fetal Medicine, we do hope that this cost of this test will come down even further. And very soon in the next few months, will pretty much match the cost of first trimester screening. In that case, we will then have to identify a new approach, which we hope to do during the course of the coming year. Meanwhile, today we uh, get down to, uh, to actually participating in the World Down Syndrome Day um, uh, uh, meeting where we will, on the eve of Down syndrome day today, discuss first the screening for Down syndrome by Dr. Colonel Rima Bhatt, and then go on to a panel, uh, where, which we will introduce later. For those of us who have uh, uh, not yet, uh, for those of us who have not, uh, are not familiar with Colonel, uh, Dr. Colonel Rima Bhatt, she has a, a background in the army and uh, uh, left her assignment there recently to join the uh, newly opened uh, Amrita Hospital in Faridabad, where she heads the fetal medicine department. And uh, we really look forward to her continuing participation in all our programs. Uh, she is also our joint secretary at the center in our uh, office bearers for the Society of Fetal Medicine. And I now hand over the forum to her uh, to go ahead and tell us uh, on the background for this. And so we go right ahead. Uh, over to Colonel uh, Dr. Reema Bhatt. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you for this introduction. I think you've made our task extremely simple. And uh, if I have the permission to share my screen. Certainly. Uh, I get yes. you greetings. So if I'm audible, I get you greetings yes. from Amrita Hospital. A very good evening to all of you present today. And let me uh, introduce you to Bentine, who is a 21-year-old Down syndrome girl. She has chosen to do theater, dance, music, and lectures full-time. And she's meeting the two Norwegian and Prime Minister candidates before she votes for elections. So that is how a Down syndrome child can be groomed. And what touched my heart was the words of a mother who said that, how can you say when people ask me, how can you say that you're blessed to have a son with Down syndrome? My outlook on life has forever changed. I see my own challenges differently. He's always showing me that life is so much bigger than self. So as clinicians, our responsibility is to provide accurate assessments of screening tests that we perform for our patients. And then, as what Kurana sir said, let parents decide. It's either termination or preparedness to handle this child with Down syndrome. So when I talk of the screening test, what is most important to understand is which is the best screening test. A test that is a good detection rate, which is able to pick up the most number of cases of Down syndrome. And another thing that is important is a low false positive rate. Because as far as prenatal screening goes, all our false positive rate translate into invasive testing, and this could result in loss of a normal fetus. As Sir has already mentioned, in the 70s, maternal age was the most important screening criteria for, for, this, for the baby with Downs. And here we were picking up only 30% cases of Down syndrome. So we all understand that this isn't a good screening test. Researchers went on with the challenges of biochemistry, and in 70s, we had the second trimester biochemistry in place. 
with a quadruple test at a detection rate of 76%, at 5% false positive rate, and triple test at 69% detection rate with a false positive rate of 5%. And what sir says, no triple test out of the window. So in the second trimester, the only test that stands good is the quadruple test. However, there was a paradigm change in prenatal screening with the first trimester becoming the center of care. And everything was based on the first trimester results. And we all know that the nuclear translucency has changed, our, has made a paradigm change in the way we diagnose Down syndrome now. But my dear friends, with maternal age and NT alone, we are still at a detection rate of only 80% with a false positive rate of 5%. So you will agree with me that we are still not at this perfect test. And even with this 80%, you need to have quality assurance, which is very important. A crown rank limb that has to satisfy 45 to 84 millimeters. You have to have perfect magnification and the perfect image to pick up your right NT. And if you've measured the NT correctly, each NT for a specific CRL has a likelihood ratio. And this, when combined with our maternal age, which is the a priori risk, we get a new likelihood ratio, a new risk for our baby. Added to this is an important tool in the armamentarium. Our biochemistry moved on to the second trimester and the biomarkers that is PAPE and pre-beta HCG became important biomarkers in the first trimester. But if you only take biochemistry, we are still detecting only 65% with a false positive rate of 5%, which by itself is not a good screening test. So if you see independently, none of these tests hold very good. And another important thing to understand in understanding biochemistry is you need to know the normal curve, the Bell's curve. You have something called as multiples of median or the moms. So any value which is more significantly more onto the right of the curve is more than two mom. Anything to the left, which is significantly less, is less than 0.5 mom. And these values become significant. Another concept that you need to understand is that these biomarkers are surrogate markers for diagnosing Down syndrome. So either they are portraying inefficient placental function or defective fetal synthesis. By itself, they do not tell us that the baby has Down syndrome. They're just surrogate markers. And also that we need to adjust these biomarkers for IVF concerns exception where a beta HCG may be more or PAPE may be low in countries where smoking is prevalent. So all these markers need to be adjusted for uh, ethnicity, etc. And the right platform needs to be used. We need to have FMF UK platform to be able to decipher the results when you use biochemistry. The ideal time to perform is at about 10 to 11 weeks. And when we combine all of this together in a good software, we get a combined risk. And this combined first trimester screening result is has a detection rate of 90% with a false positive rate of 5%. So we realize that with the combined first trimester screening, we are definitely at the best screening performance. So where we were at 30% with maternal age in the 70s, we went to biochemistry at 70%, NT alone at 80%, and combined screening at 90%. So the most important screening for Down syndrome is combined first trimester screening. And there's been a huge uptake of combined first trimester screening, which has definitely led to diagnosis of most of the major abnormality over when we analyzed the result over 38 years. Now, the question is that can we get better than 90%? Yes, we can. And this can be done by incorporation of certain ultrasound markers, which we can incorporate in the first trimester. Nasal bone, 60% of babies with trisomy 21 have an absent or hypoplastic nasal bone. Ductus venosus, absent or reversal of the ductus venosus is an important marker for chromosomal abnormalities and also gives us clue to the possibility of cardiac defects, fetal death, but also at the same time, 80% of these babies are normal. Tricuspid regurgitation is another marker that gives us a clue to chromosomal abnormalities. So the question is that how much is the increase in the detection? It goes up to 96% with a drop in false positive rate to 2%. So where we were at 90% and a false positive rate of 5% with combined screening, we 
go up to 96% with a drop in false positive rate to 2%, which definitely decreases the need for invasive testing. But can we offer it to all? Well, it requires expertise. It's time consuming, not available. So this can be used as a stringent protocol in cases where we need to follow these ultrasound markers. Now let's see how do we go about the reports. So whenever you get a report, try to see why is my patient screen positive? So you look at the mom values. Now this patient had an NT of 2.5 mom, a PAPI at one mom and beta HCG at 1.2 mom. The a priori risk was one in, one in 200, but the posterior risk was one in 100. So you realize that the risk of increased NT was the one that caused an increased risk in the combined first. You have to understand that NT greater than the 99 centile definitely deserves an invasive testing. Here, you're not only looking at aneuploidies, there's also a risk of fetal death, major defects. So these are the patients where you need to counsel for a direct invasive. There is no role of serial more than the 99 centile. So when you have a report of increased combined first trimester screening, please look at the mom values, look at your NT images, try to find out why is my patient screen positive. You definitely would offer a invasive testing, CVS and amniocentesis. Please don't be scared. They both have equal sensitivity and specificity. Chromosomal microarray is the way forward now. The kind of invasive testing we need to ask our patients for. And as far as the risk of loss is concerned, both of them are comparable. Now, uh, what we found in this patient, this patient opted for CVS, microarray was normal, the anomaly scan was normal. But uh, are we out of the woods? No, we, are not. we reassured the patient as well. Patient came back to 26 weeks with ascites, pleural effusion, and uh, the whole exome revealed Noonan syndrome. So we need to understand that increased NT is not just about chromosomes. It is also about a number of genetic syndromes that may be associated and therefore our counseling and the need for invasive testing becomes important. We need to assure our parents that with increased NT, it's not just chromosomal defects, it's also cardiac defects. We need a fetal eco, skeletal dysplasia, genetic syndromes and fetal infections that we are looking for. But also reassure your patient that if all of it is normal, 70% of the times these fetuses have a normal outcome. We also need to understand that when we're looking at the biochemistry for Down syndrome, we're screening for Downs, but we are picking up something else in some 70 to 80% of the patients. Now, this was a patient who underwent amniocentesis for increased risk for trisomy 21. QFPCR for 21 was normal, but the microarray report came 22Q deletion, uh, duplication that was detected. So, it's not, so as I mentioned, that these biomarkers are surrogate markers for a chromosomal abnormality, not necessarily that the baby has Down syndrome. So uh, whenever we have a report, now this was this patient who had an age risk of one in 743, but the combined risk was one in 113. So if you look at the biomarkers, you look at the mom values, the beta SCG was at 1.3 mom, PAPE was at 0.18 mom which is much less than 0.5 mom, and it was normal 1.25 mom. So here I understand that the risk of Downs is coming more probably because of the biomarkers. And we need to understand that PAPE is released by the placenta. It could be a marker of placental dysfunction. And these are the babies, if the chromosomes are normal, are the ones who are heading for growth restriction or for preeclampsia. So these are the patients where you can let the patient opt out for NIPT because if the chromosomes are normal, we know that the placental function may not be doing well and we need to follow up them closely for growth restriction and preeclampsia. We also need to understand that the positive predictive, now if a patient says that if my, I'm screen positive, what are the chances of my baby having Down syndrome? So this depends on the prevalence of the disease. So in a low risk population, the prevalence is low. So the risk may be 3%. But in a high-risk woman who is more than 35, the positive predictive value may be as high as 10%. So it depends on how the prevalence of the disease is in a particular of Down syndrome, whether it's advanced maternal age or a lower age, age group mother. Now, there's another concept that we need to understand is intermediate risk. 
Now, suppose our patient comes in a risk. Suppose our high risk is one in 100 or one in 250. Different labs take different cutoffs. If our risk comes somewhere between one in 100 to one in 1,000 or one in 250 to one in 1,000, this is intermediate risk. But this intermediate risk is not something that we can leave alone. These are the cases where we need to offer some better form of screening or advance to, to bring down the risk. So you can offer the markers that we just discussed in the first trimester or NIPT as a secondary test, as a secondary screening tool is a good test to bring down the risk of this patient. Now, suppose you've offered this, the risk comes out low. This is good. You can just offer a routine sonography at 20 weeks, but if it's high risk, this patient can go for invasive testing. So NIPT is a very good screening tool. It's got a very high detection rate, a low false positive rate. But what we understand that it needs to be used judiciously and performs very well as a secondary screening tool. With the change, with the uptake of combined testing, there has been a dramatic change in the invasive testing where advanced maternal age was the, the indication for screening at 77% has come down to 15%. The first trimester screening and ultrasound abnormalities now form the major chunk of patients who are undergoing invasive testing. So this is the change that combined first trimester screening has brought to the need for invasive testing. A little note on the twin pregnancies, which become so important. The first important thing is that we need to know the chorionicity, chorionicity and chorionicity, because that changes our risk for the fetus. NT is an acceptable method of screening in twins, but the best method is still the combined first trimester screening, even for our twin pregnancies. If you look at the performance, they perform as good as the first trimester at 89% combined, 86% for dichorionic and 87% for monochorionic twin pregnancies. Now, this was a patient who's the dichorionic twin pregnancy, one fetus with increased NT, you need to understand that when you have a dichorionic pair, you will get a separate risk for both the fetuses, depending on the NT. And this patient, now, once you have an increased NT, again, I reiterate, the way forward is invasive testing. But if the biochemistry was high and we had a combined first trimester screening, which was high, these twins could have been offered NIPT as well because the performance of NIPT, even in twin pregnancy, has gone up to almost 99%. It's a good screening test. Definitely, we would not know which twin is affected. So if the NIPT comes as high risk, these are the patients where invasive testing can be offered later. For monochorionic, it's both the twins have the same risk. Now, a banishing twin is an important uh, question that a lot of patients ask that I'm an IVF conception, I have a fetal pole, can I undergo combined first trimester screening? The answer is no. In case a banishing twin had a fetal pole, then we cannot offer biochemistry. It's just NT alone that forms our screening modality. For triplets, there is no role of biochemistry. It's just the NT that forms the basis of screening for the triplet pregnancy. Now, NIPT, Sir so just mentioned it's it's created and assured a new era as far as prenatal diagnosis is concerned. We can use it as a secondary screening tool. It's a very effective method. It can be used as a primary screening tool in patients who are affording and who want the combined first trimester screening and also the NIPT. But let me tell you that NIPT cannot, under any condition, replace the first trimester screening. The ISWO guidelines. In 2013, as far as first trimester screening goes, was elaborate. We had to look at all practically all the organs in the first trimester. But if you look at the 2023 guidelines, it's as good as a second trimester anomaly scan. So we just, just cannot miss the first trimester scan at the cost of NIPT. Even a systematic review said that even in a low risk population, the first trimester scan definitely performs very well. So again, I reiterate, please don't NIPT replace the first trimester scan or the first trimester screening. If the negative predictive value is seen, both of them, both the combined screening and the NIPT have the same negative predictive value. So why offer NIPT when we have a, a very efficient tool in the armamentarium? Now, uh, second trimester screening, I come back to the quadruple test. Where does, it, where, where does it stand today? It's only for the late bookers. We cannot offer quadruple test 
if we had the privilege of offering the combined first trimester screening. Integrated screening, where we do the combined first trimester screen, keep it a secret to the patient, then do a quadruple test, integrate both of them together, and then offer the final risk. I think that's not possible in our country. Very few labs are integrating the quadruple and the first trimester scan. So if you can't integrate your quadruple and your first trimester, there is no role of offering a quadruple test to your patient if you've done a combined screening for your patient. Integration is important. Step by sequential, again, for a low risk, you need to again do a quadruple test and integrate the quadruple test with your first trimester biochemistry, which again, I reiterate, is not being done by most of the labs. So we can't do a better screening test like a combined test in the first trimester and then do an isolated quadruple test to reassure ourselves that no, we are, do, we, are, we are doing a double test to be sure that the baby does not have Downs. That just doesn't work out. So the best form of screening is the contingent screening. For low risk, let's leave them alone. It has a good negative predictive value and we can be sure that this baby does not have Down syndrome. Intermediate risk, yes, we have ultrasound markers. Let's offer it to them. We have the court test, but let's ask the lab if it can integrate the test. And NIPT definitely is a very good secondary screening tool for all the intermediate risk patients. We have something more in the armamentarian. We have the court test in the first trimester now coming up. It adds alpha fetoprotein as a biomarker where the detection rate goes up to 90%, which is not uh, really good. Uh, as much as the combined screening. It's as good as the combined screening. But what is important is the false positive rate comes down to 1.4. And this definitely brings down the, the number of invasive testings that we have to perform. And therefore, if your patient can afford it, it has been validated and cord first trimester screening can be offered to the patient. And in addition, the alpha fetoprotein gives us some clue of the structural defects. But nowadays, the ultrasound in the first trimester picks up all those structural defects that alpha fetoprotein wants to point out to. An additional advantage is the preeclampsia screening that definitely can happen along with the quad test. They speak about the PENTA test in the first trimester. They, have, they say that by adding inhibin A, the detection can go up to 98% for trisomy 21 with a decrease in the false positive rate to 1.2%. Now, uh, this still needs further validation. So as long as we have validation, I think it's not right to offer to our patients yet. What about the PENTA screen in the second trimester? They have added glycosylated HCG to the four markers, alpha fetoprotein, HCG, estriol, and dinerbrin A, but the detection only goes up maximum to 83% with a false positive rate of 5%. So if you see that what performs best for, for us is the combined first trimester screening. So I, which test to choose for our patients, what to advise, early diagnosis, combined test is here to stay. Court test is only for late bookers. Genetic sonogram, a lot of people say that get a scan done in the second trimester, it'll rule out Down syndrome. But we need to know that at most it picks up 50 to 60% with all the markers that we looked at in the genetic sonogram. Integrated and sequential screening, most Indian labs do not integrate, so we need to think twice before asking for it. Contingent screening works best. 11 to 13 week ultrasound is a very important tool in pregnancy, and NIPT is a good test. It's an advanced test. It's a powerful tool in our armamentarian. However, it definitely cannot replace the 11 to 13 week scan, which is an integral part of antenatal care. So thank you so much for your patient hearing. And these are the words of a Down syndrome child. I have amazing eyes and an um, infectious laugh. And I always know when you need a hug. I also have Down syndrome. It's part of me, but not a definition of who I am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rima, for that wonderful uh, talk uh, that you have given us and set the pace uh, for the rest of the evening. Uh, we uh, would like to take this chance to thank you and request you to uh, stay till the end of the program to answer some of our uh, queries that we get from our uh, attendees. I'd also like to take this chance on behalf of our uh, president, Dr. Bimal Sani, and our president-elect, Dr. Mohit Shah, who are on the program today,
to welcome uh, all of you here once more, and also to extend a very warm welcome to 12 of our attendees who are here from overseas attending the program today. It's indeed very heartwarming that we now have a presence not only in Asia, but across the Eastern European uh, continents as well. And so uh, with that, we will uh, request Kanrima again to uh, wait until the end of the program. And uh, may I now hand over the forum for a few minutes to our trade partner for an announcement. Welcome back after that break. And we it is now time for our uh, panel discussion, which will be much more uh, broad-based uh, than what we've spoken so far. We've uh, put our steps into the world of science and now we move into uh, the real world, the more uh, humane aspects and uh, what the world currently thinks. And I leave it to our panelists to guide us through this. We have... Uh, uh, the, the coordinators for the panel are Dr. Sangeeta Gupta, who needs no introduction. She's been a part of the Society of Fetal Medicine since its inception. She's a professor and is uh, at the Molana Zad Medical College, New Delhi, and the Associated Hospitals, and uh, one of our favorite uh, faces in fetal medicine. And we know that if we have one of our wonderful patients who can't afford very much, uh, she will give them the best treatment and the world-class treatment that she can ever get. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sangeeta, for always being there for us and for our patients. Our other uh, moderator is Dr. Chanchal Singh, who also does not need any uh, introduction. She is a familiar name uh, for Society of Field Medicine and, and all the other associations that are associated with women's health in our part of the world. And I look forward uh, to them leading this uh, panel. Dr. Chanchal is currently um, at the Rainbow Hospital, um, which is in South Delhi, and heads the fetal uh, uh, medicine services there. So over to you for your panel, and if you could please introduce the panelists when you start. Thank you, Dr. Kurana, uh, for your kind introduction, and I think Dr. Chanchal can take over. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the kind introduction. I will share my screen. Can I share my screen? Yeah. Uh, by the time Dr. <laughs> Chanchal starts uh, with her slides, I just want to say that the objective of this panel is much more than only scientific information. Uh, we have to look at other perspectives of screening in which the ethics are involved, a woman's rights and choices are discussed and uh, how to ensure that we are truly taking an informed consent from her. And uh, our objective should be inclusion of these people in daily lives rather than just terminating these pregnancies. Dr. Chanchal, please. So uh, when Dr. Sangeeta and I were discussing and we saw the, the paradigm that Dr. Kurana had outlined in, in the flyer itself, human rights, fetal rights, parental reproductive options, and social inclusion of Down syndrome. Can we find a common ground there? And as the, the stage has been said by our previous speakers regarding what is the correct thing to do, but then what happens in real life? That, that's I, We hope that we'll be able to take you through uh, these uh, via our cases. I have an excellent lineup of panelists here. Dr. Khurana, the heart and soul of Society of Fetal Medicine and the reason we are all here today. Dr. Uh, Jaya Chavla, she is a dear friend and she is an associate professor at the uh, uh, RML Hospital in Obstetrics and Gynecology and an SFM Delhi Executive Committee member. Dr. Naveen Gupta, he heads the neonatology at Madhuka Rainbow Children Hospital and takes care of uh, all our neonates. Dr. Ranjana Mishra, she is a geneticist. She is a senior uh, medical officer in the Department of Genetics at Malana Azad Medical College. And Dr. Tamkeen Khan, a very respected figure and a known academician. She is a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the Illegal Muslim University at JNMC. And she is the founder secretary of Silver Society of India. Dear panelists, we welcome you all. On behalf of Dr. Dr. Sangeeta, I welcome you all. And let's go on to our first. Uh, question of the panel. So, 
Dr. Tamkeen, I would like to uh, put this question to you. Would you offer Down syndrome training to all pregnant women? Uh, thank you so much for that question, uh, Dr. Chanchal, and thank you, Dr. Ashok and Dr. Sangeeta for including me in this very important discussion. Uh, we all know the incidence of Down syndrome around 1 in 650 to 8.30. 1.3 lakh children born every year in India, contributing to about 15 to 20% of babies with intellectual disability. The lifespan of a Down syndrome baby is 50 to 60 years today. Uh, unlike that of Edwards or Patau, which you know puts a very high social, financial, emotional burden, as well as a burden on the healthcare system. So all you know, Western guidelines they recommend screening, universal screening, offering it to everybody. In India, it is only Indian Academy of Pediatricians which clearly mentions that screening should be afford, uh, offered to all pregnant women. It is not a part of the national health uh, program and mainly limited to the private sector. Foxy, one Foxy conclave on decision tree recommends it. WHO only emphasizes on primary prevention and talks about the rights of the disabled persons and recommends screening only the high risk population. On a personal and a very practical level, uh, we see that women come for very late booking. We all know the cost of the tests. The lack of comprehension and the inability to differentiate between screening and diagnostic tests uh, to the population that I cater to, most of them they have do not know their LMPs. Then the ultrasound, the methods that we use, the ultrasound done, the validity of that ultrasound and the lab markers which are being done by every lab is not you know, valid. Then again, the indecisiveness of the parents to opt for invasive test. They will go for the screening and then they will think so many times in spite of the pre-test counseling. And after a screening, some of them, they assume that the process of amniocentesis sometimes is somehow related to the treatment of the problem. And then of course, uh, I also cater to a, uh, to a population which is mainly Muslim population with very clear cut religious beliefs about termination of pregnancy, even for a malformed baby. And sometimes, you know, events, once you get just the screening test positive, they will not return back because of the cost. They will just go to some private uh, sector and they'll get their pregnancy terminated, leading to loss of maybe many normal babies. So I personally only offer it selectively to only a certain group of patients whom I think that they have some background knowledge, they are able to comprehend what I'm talking about. And though I believe that this may be a description and discrimination based on class, but uh, I don't know, and maybe sometimes this may lead to certain questions or lawsuits like, you know, the problem with the, you know, uh, why did you give birth to a malformed baby or litigation that of wrongful birth or even sometimes wrongful life. But then again, uh, I, I'm unable to offer it to all women. The total, you know, salary of most of the women, 80% of the women that I'm catering to is monthly salaries around 8,000 to 10,000. Uh, yeah, uh, rupees. And sometimes you issues may arise that I was not offered because I did not know that this could, any uh, normal pregnancy could have a bad outcome. Just like stillbirth, people complain that we were never told during the antenatal life that this could be an outcome. So I do not offer it, you know, uniformly for every, every patient. Yes, ma'am. Very, very rightly said. So the idea of putting it putting the question across was just to get get that that one size will never fit all we all know this table that the incidence is increasing no age is immune and probably the ones who can least afford it are the ones who will be least able to take care of that child for a lifelong liability so i think somewhere we have to incorporate in all of it. the patient should not be expected to pay so i i feel that uh, it should be incorporated in routine in all uh, across all sectors. And when we talk about screening, the objective of screening is provision of information. We, we tell them that this is available and then it's up to them to, to, uh, to uh, whether take it or not, that that's up to them. And uh, Dr. Uh, Sangeeta especially asked me to put this line there that women should feel empowered by our counseling, a non-directive evidence-based counseling and the decision whether to opt for screening or testing, or not for that matter, should be respected. So, 
handing over to you. Chanchal, can I just make one uh, yes. comment here? I yeah, think yeah. Uh, uh, I really appreciate. We can't hear you. Uh, Dr. Sangeeta, you got muted, yeah. unfortunately. I'm so sorry. Yes, so I, that. Now we can, yeah. 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 I appreciate uh, Dr. Tomkin's honest confession uh, mm -hmm. because I also work in a similar sector. So mm -hmm. there are many other factors besides the scientific evidence which determine that whether you can offer screening to everyone and or not. And in the course of that, we will have a detailed discussion about how uh, how important counseling is also and do we have an infrastructure in place for that mm -hmm. you will take this case yeah yeah not this case you will take or shall, shall i okay so dr jaya we would like you to uh, put mm -hmm. some light on the case who's a 36 years old second gravida para one she's 15 weeks pregnancy comes her results come as high risk for trisomy 21 on a quad marker and uh, like dr tamkin said that uh, she wants to opt for termination of pregnancy so can you tell us how would you counsel her right good evening ma'am good evening sir and thank you sfm so this is a great opportunity to discuss counseling in such a case and before I begin with the actual session of counseling, I would like to highlight that in my setup, I personally make sure that it is not a woman's counseling, but a couple counseling. Even if I have to wait for the partner for some time, which I'm able to afford, I do that. Number two, the initial part of the discussion is about the vernacular that they're comfortable with, because all my scientific jargon may not go down too well with the understanding of the patient who is my target. Number three, I need to understand whether they have undergone a pre-test counseling for this kind of a test or not. Because many of them are totally clueless to the idea of what exactly is Down syndrome. And only when they have landed onto a high-risk result, then their Google-based knowledge sends them into a tizzy and they are more anxious than aware of what the facts are. So my counseling session begins with what exactly is Down syndrome? It is a condition based on chromosomal abnormality. Every individual has 23 pairs of chromosomes and an offspring tends to acquire 23 of these from the mother and another 23 from the father. So a karyotype can be labeled as 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 23. And in this sequence, the number 21 chromosome, as has already been discussed, if it is three in number in place of a pair, then that is what becomes a baby with down. The next part is what to anticipate when a baby is going to be down that they are going to be a little different from the normal children who are around there in the society, but they're likely to be born alive. They're likely to stay alive to a good old age. They will require some more help with their learning abilities, some more support from their families. They might have some physical concerns which are different from normal children. However, the degree that they would require support, the degree that they might have physical concerns, varies from one down children to the other like we are not all similar similarly our all down children are also not similar to one another they're different in their degrees of disabilities number three it is important to understand that the numbers that the, the quad risk being high let me take an example of the quad risk being say for example one in 121 we could we would call that a high risk so coming to numbers i would like to tell them that what tests they have undergone right now, if there was a demographic profile with similar maternal age of 36 years, similar parity index, the mother is not a smoker, her ethnicity is Asian, all of that, if there was a similar spectrum of women, then 121 women out of that particular spectrum, only one is likely to have a baby suffering from Down syndrome. In other words, another 120 women with a similar demographic profile are unlikely to have a baby suffering from Down, which means the likelihood of having a baby with Down with this kind of a result is extremely small when compared to the likelihood of having a baby without Down syndrome. So when I understand this magnitude, they understand that the quantum of risk is not as high as they have imagined by the so-called term of high risk. The next we go on to discuss the options of how to refine this risk because I cannot certify on the basis of a quad risk as to whether this particular baby in question is a down or not. So then comes to uh, the role of whether how certain they want to be in terms of having a baby with down. 
For this, I offer them two choices. Number one, that if they want to be extremely certain, no holes barred whether this baby is going to be down or not, then the best option they have is to undergo an invasive testing. And if the woman is coming to me at 15 weeks, then 17 weeks out of her amniocentesis, wherein she will be required to lie down, have a needle put inside the womb, under visualization with, a, with an ultrasound screen so as to not prick the baby, take out fluid from around the baby, send it for testing, she would get one report within a brief period of two to five days, wherein the chances of having a baby would down would be clarified. And another report within the next two weeks or so, wherein she'll get an entire karyotype 23 chromosomes reported. And that will be doubly confirming of whether the baby is down or not. So if she has reported to me at 15 weeks, then we have a good enough time for all these tests to be performed. And within a very, very safe window, she will have a very certain answer to whether her baby is down or not. But this comes with a baggage, with a risk of procedure related risk, since we are entering the sacred cavity with a needle, then we are likely to have a risk of procedure related risk of one to one in 100, one in 400 to one in 500 pregnancies. So if he is not willing to accept this risk, because a baby who is absolutely normal, who's not down would also likely be, is also likely to be terminated with this procedure. So in that event, if she wants to escape this risk, then the other idea is a superior screening test, but it is a superior screening test. So the certainty is a little less at 99.5%, but she can opt for the superior screening test in the form of a blood test. This blood test will be different from the invasive testing in the fact that she will not require a needle to be put into her womb, but it will give her information only about five chromosomes in place of 23 and 99.5% detection rate for downs. However, the cost, the turnaround time for this test has to be discussed. And I have to tell her that if 99.5% certainty, if her baby turns out to be high risk, then I will not be able to offer her termination solely based on the result of this NIPS. And I would like to confirm this with 100% certainty that the baby is down and only then go ahead with termination in case they require, because otherwise I can offer them a list of schools, institutions, websites where they might have more information regarding how to support this baby if the family chooses to go ahead with this kind of testing. Can we, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so uh, from my perspective, I have two things to say in this case. One is that before the board was done, uh, what was the counseling done to the parents that uh, they thought of opting for termination uh, only on a screening test. So usually the uh, counseling should, which is done should be very robust. Patient should have a clarity that this is only a screening test. And if high risk, she would have to opt for a invasive testing to, you know, choose her reproductive options as, uh, you know, um, uh, severe as termination of pregnancy. Prescribing information is, sometimes deficient and inaccurate and fails to fulfill the objectives of perspective of uh, how one would have to proceed ahead. So one cannot offer a termination of pregnancy only on a positive screening test, be it a uh, uh, serum screening uh, or a combined screening or be it an IPS, number one. Number two, Whenever you do a screening test, please make sure that it is offered by a standard person who is competent to counsel and it should be conducted at a center which is not only qualified technically to conduct the screening test, but is also, also ethically qualified. By that, I mean that they have uh, uh, people who can really take the patient through uh, 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 while doing this test and make a clarity in their mind that it is just a screening test and they would, if it comes out to be high risk, they would have to opt for a, a diagnostic test and only then they can exercise the option of termination of pregnancy. So the outcome of this baby was that this woman opted for NIPS, which was low risk. And fortunately, she delivered a full-term baby, at, uh, which was a girl and is alive and healthy. We move on to our ne next case, a 39-year-old second gravida, previous one in miscarriage. She had an IUI conception and she came to the PT medicine clinic highly distressed because her dual marker at 12 weeks was high risk. 
the uh, adjusted risk was one in 236 and the neutral scan was reported as normal. How would you counsel this lady, Dr. Benjamin? Uh, thank you, Dr. Chanchal, for this uh, very pertinent question, uh, which is a very uh, uh, common scenario in our day-to-day -day counseling, which we encounter uh, counseling in a women with advanced age uh, who has come to us with a uh, with a positive uh, with a high risk screen. So, uh, counseling, genetic counseling, uh, or a pre-test counseling, which forms a very important uh, integral uh, part of uh, the session has been uh, made easy by my previous uh, panelist, Dr. Jaya. So what I want to emphasize over here that we should always, while doing the counseling, we should always uh, start on a positive note. So what we note over here is that this is a 39 year old lady who has come with a high risk uh, screen of one in uh, 236 for Down syndrome. Now, if you look at these charts, now these charts of, uh, are very useful in our, uh, um, in our counseling sessions. I always rely a lot on these um, charts, these uh, pictorial representations. So even for the unlettered uh, uh, couples, they come very handy to make them, you know, to make them understand the chromosomes, the all the inheritance and all that. So uh, if you look at this uh, chart, what we find that uh, in the first trimester, uh, the at 12 weeks, the lady who is 39 year old, the risk of having a Down syndrome baby is uh, around one in 90. Now, if you go back to her, uh, the uh, aneuploidy screen result, it is one in 236. So what is there to tell to this couple is that actually the screen has provided a, it has reduced the risk compared to her background age-related risk. This chart talks about the age-related risk. Now, if we adjust uh, this risk, considering all the biochemical parameters and the anti profile so this has actually reduced. So this, starting with this note, uh, puts the couple uh, at ease. Now, uh, so uh, before moving ahead, now this is again, to emphasize again, this is just a screening test. This is not, this is not a confirmatory test. Now, what do we do? What is the next step? So uh, here, uh, for confirmation, uh, the couple is count. So I would, I would, uh, although the ultrasound is uh, normal, the NT scan is normal, I also look at the pedigree. I look at the obstetric history, whether there is previous pregnancy losses, is there any other affected child in the family, which becomes very important to me as a geneticist and to decide for further uh, mode of investigation. So uh, considering a low risk situation, that means uh, she has not had previous uh, abortions. There is no other uh, affected child with malformation or any um, you know, uh, intellectual disability in the family in the, on both sides, extended family. So in this situation, I would I uh, like to offer her um, uh, NIPS um, and, or amniocentesis, uh, which is an invasive test at 16 weeks. Considering that, uh, I mean, um, again, you know, before offering these tests, a lot of um, counseling has to be done regarding the yield of these tests, the risk associated, and what is exactly uh, this test is uh, going to tell you about. So uh, this has been elaborated by Dr. Jaya, Jaya previously. Um, yes. So, yeah. so, um, what we wanted to highlight was that when there's a, we interpret these risks, the same risk will mean differently to different people. For somebody, a risk in one in 100 is also less. It's only one in 100. And for some parents, even one in 1,000 is a risk. So a lot of this is not just background risk. It is the patient's perception. And with, through our panel, we've all discussed the sensitivity detection rate our focus on the panel is to how to adapt it and how to interpret it in, in real context with real patients sitting across from us. So this, in fact, in this uh, this particular patient, Dr. Ranjana, she opted to do no further testing. She she just, uh, uh, she said, I want this baby and I do not choose to do any further testing. And that we, we respected that that thought process. She had a cesarean delivery at term for HGR and oligohydramnus, and she had a 2.3 kg baby boy who's alive. Moving on to, so I, I here there is a statement by Professor Kipros Nikolaidis that our responsibility is to provide parents with accurate assessment of risks rather than create arbitrary definitions of high end risk. So it is just one in 250. It's just a lab which is producing that report. Anything more than one in 250 is low risk. Anything less than one in 250 is high risk. Our responsibility is to provide them with an accurate assessment of risks. 
next question ma'am yeah before we go to the next question i think it is again important to assert here that women make choices not just on you know what reports we give them or what risks we assign them they make their choices even according to their values what religious beliefs they have and what preferences they have see in this woman she was 39 years conceived with an iui uh, she opted to continue with the pregnancy and uh, maybe that was one of the reasons she went for an nips and fortunately things have come good for her yeah. as well yeah. this patient so there are many other anything yeah. yeah there are many other facets uh, when a woman takes a decision to undergo a test mm. yeah coming to the next case uh, so uh, here we have dr kurana who's going to you know uh, really enlighten us on this tricky situation we have come through she's a 26 years old primi uh, she had come to us with a dual marker which was high risk uh, in which uh, the beta hcg was 2.4 moms uh, quite high and the pape was also borderline 0.5 moms and the adjusted risk came out to be 1 in 168 her nt scan was perfectly normal and at 20 weeks when she underwent an anomaly scan there was an intracardiac echogenic focus so uh, dr kurana no question no ma'am give him the next one also yeah <laughs> we'll we'll kind of give you the outcome and then ask her opinion yeah. sir we have said so the most difficult one for you couple op opted for an nips and uh, this again was a low risk then which i think was probably the right choice as a clinician i would say Uh, however a full term normal vaginal delivery was there it was a 3.1 kg baby boy and the baby was suspected to have down syndrome you know at birth as they found that the baby was hypotonic uh, unexplained hypotonia was there and had a sandal gap uh, though there was no other typical abnormality nor the typical fasces so a fish was ordered Uh, and it came out to be a mosaic trisomy twenty one. So your your thoughts on that, and how would you go about it? Thank you, and thank you for including me in this panel. Uh, we really interesting uh, concepts coming through, and uh, let me um, add a bit of fire to the fuel, if I may say, rather than fuel to the fire, because what is happening here is we're trying to give some take home messages. but this case might show us a little differently and there is no doubt that the first thing that we should do in the background of all of this is to make sure that our counseling is correct and one counseling that we must include is that all screening is not 100% and that applies to uh, nipt as well one of the reasons where nipt fails is when we have a mosaic condition and for the uninitiated amongst us a mosaic is when all the cell lines are not the same and some cells in the fetus um, may not be uh, abnormal and some would be normal and they could be different percentage there is also the concept of when the placenta is abnormal and the fetus is normal and that again could result then in an abnormal uh, outcome of that particular screening test so nipt being a placental test because that's where the dna is coming from is more prone to be a false positive compared to a false negative test the false negative situation would arise either in a situation where we don't have uh, uh, where we have an interpretation that is not based on an adequate fetal fraction or where the fetal fraction is replaced by deeper sequencing you could again not be deep enough to pick this up but here is a situation where if we look carefully there was this adjusted risk of 1 in 168 on the basis of the first trimester combined screen which made us alert to say that look i don't like this value it's not a, a very straightforward clear negative and then i have two options i could either uh, do nothing or i could do something out of the some things that i can do i can offer invasive testing which the patient can then opt for or i can offer nipt which is a more advanced screening test and let the patient make the choice provided she and her relatives have been counseled and then they will understand that yes not everything is so perfect and that this is one of those exceptional situations where things did go wrong in terms of the whole situation but we do understand in this situation that this is exactly what it is and then the question is what do we do now that she has a baby with a trisomy 21 which is a mosaic the first thing is to have the knowledge that 
not every mosaic trisomy 21 will have the same outcome as a baby with trisomy 21, which means that the quality of life may be perfectly normal. The quality of life can be as uh, identical to anybody else with trisomy 21, which means a variable degree of intellectual compromise and physical compromise. So there are these options that then have to be explained to the patient, but most importantly, it's important for them to accept the fact that the prognosis is not definite, to accept the fact that babies with Down syndrome and adults with Down syndrome uh, can be educable and can go to school, that they can have gainful employment, that they may have problems for which they require special education, they may not be educable, but they can be trained. And there are several uh, organizations that look at it differently. Uh, this business of feeling sorry for themselves, etc., completely has to stop. They have to accept the situation. The sooner they accept it, the better. They have to make sure that they work towards their families, the school and society accepting this, that it is an ongoing battle in any part of the world and that they have to fight this battle and we can provide them with support from support groups. And that is the way we really need to go with them. And that of course, we will be able to guide them in the next pregnancy because it is possible that uh, the mosaic might be of a very odd type which needs to be assessed carefully. Also the odd chance that, was it really a, a true mosaic? Was it one of those translocations that signals quite differently? And therefore I'd like to involve a very uh, well-grounded geneticist to then look into this whole case. So that's how I would go ahead and handle this case. So I think he has given two very important messages. One, that the counseling which was done when the screening test was done uh, is very, very important. Again, a false negative should not be ushered on a site uh, because all the responsibility of this kind of outcome cannot be the onus of the doctor alone. So here again, counseling is very important and we should familiarize them with the concept of a false negative when they opt for again another screening test which is very well though it is very robust so that is one very important thing and second the way forward to be shown how to be with them through this journey so the perception of the risk of miscarrying a wanted pregnancy or the birth of a chromosomal abnormal baby just depends on the expectations of the parents and we as clinicians here can only provide factually accurate evidence and a non-directive counseling. Coming to the next case of Benji, a 32-year-old primary gravida, first trimester training was low risk. The anomaly scan kit leaker was normal. And she came for a second opinion at 35 weeks and six days for suspected small for gestation, suspected growth restriction. On the ultrasound, the growth was on the 8th centile, though the Dopplers were normal. However, the nasal bone was noted to be hypoplastic. Uh, the baby had an atroventricular settle canal defect, and the long bones were on the 5th centile. Now, at 35 weeks and 5 days, how would you counsel, counsel this patient? And more pertinently, would you offer diagnostic testing beyond 32-34 weeks? We're opening um, a whole box, can of worms. Yes. This is a very, uh, yeah, Dr. Chanchal, a very tricky situation uh, uh, for, for the clinicians, especially for the obstetricians. Uh, again, um, a lot of emphasis, a lot of role of counseling comes here again and, you know, an informed um, uh, choice to be given to the couple. So, uh, yes, uh, we do uh, face the situation when, especially in public health setup, we do face the situation when they actually land up late in gestation with this report, this kind of report, and which is very suggestive. These pointers are towards um, uh, suspected uh, trisomy 21 Down syndrome. This is what is there in my mind. And uh, now, uh, how, to, um, uh, how to go about it? So, uh, at this gestation in advanced uh, pregnancy, Again, uh, you know, after uh, taking the couple through um, uh, what we are dealing with, what is there in our mind, what we are suspecting, and uh, what would be the outcome if such a baby is born. After making them go through this whole uh, scenario, uh, the next question comes about uh, whether to confirm or not. Yes, the confirmatory tests are available. They should be given the choice. So, uh, 
why uh, I, I mean it should be a, a balanced uh, counseling where you should it, and it should be an open ended uh, the decision should be left to them counseling if uh, 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 the actual testing if they really want to do they want to go ahead it's a uh, it should be respected and it becomes important also because um, by a confirmatory test first of all the uh, chances are more uh, for having a negative, uh, I mean, uh, having a good outcome. Even if you do get it confirmed, it will uh, make them prepare for this uh, uh, eventuality of having a, a Down syndrome. So they can gather all their resources, they are mentally prepared and uh, um, plan their delivery in an adequate, well-equipped center uh, and gives them time for you know acclimatization to this uh, uh, news that they are going to um, bring in a affected baby. And uh, last but not the least, a negative result uh, puts all the uh, um, I mean it puts rest to all the fears, the anxiety of the couple. So uh, yes, uh, because the diagnostic test is available after due uh, pre-test counseling. Um, I would, uh, yeah, I would offer these um, uh, tests to this couple. Absolutely. So, the, this uh, patient opted not to do diagnostic testing at that point in time. She went into labor and had an emergency cesarean for fetal distress. Fortunately, the baby was stable, and the fish was sent, and this was indeed trisomy twenty-one. Now, Doctor Naveen, you you uh, were called in to. Uh, be there at the delivery of this baby and uh, the next day when you meet them, uh, how would you counsel this couple? Yeah. So, uh, thank you. First of all, thank you, Dr. Chanchal, for making me a part of this panel. So, uh, now we know that we understand that uh, the baby is having Down syndrome and uh, trisomy 21 and a lot has been already discussed about this. So, the first part of counseling uh, to this couple is breaking the news. So, maybe in the antenatal counseling, they were aware that there is a risk that this baby may, be, may have a problem. So, uh, because of the various uh, features which are present on the ultrasound. So, first of all, we will break the news as uh, rightly has been discussed previously that this is a condition in which uh, there are three copies of uh, the chromosome 21 and uh, these babies, they are slightly different from the normal kids and uh, we should not expect too much from them. So these are special babies and they are very good in their own sense. So a little bit of positive about them. And then at the same time, mentioning what all physical and intellectual problem these babies can have. So first of all, we should tell them about that. These babies, the growth rate, they will grow at a different pace. So we should not compare them with the other peers, the normal peers. Secondly, about the milestones that these babies, they may be slow to achieve their milestones, but normally they achieve all the milestones. Third is about that a little bit of intellectual disability is always there in these babies or the physical one. And uh, for that, they need to be, you need to be, uh, we need to be taking care of and we need to be doing special tests, certain tests in these babies, like going system wise, we can tell them that first of all, the most common is that 50% of these Down syndrome babies, they may have cardiovascular problem. So a good echocardiography or the ultrasound of the heart by a pediatric cardiologist is very must for them. Secondly, the other organs also are involved. So a good, they may have hearing problem and they may have visual problem. So even in the follow-up, a hearing test is must and then a eye examination is must. And sometimes the hearing issue and the visual problem may lead to the language and the speech delay in these babies. So th this must be taken care of. Certain routine tests are very mandatory. They are high risk of having hypothyroidism. So sometimes they may need uh, thyroid hormone supplementation also. Then uh, some uh, when they grow older, so there are certain GI issues like gastrointestinal issues like constipation. These kids are slightly on the obese, obese sides. However, they are special kids and they are certainly, they are uh, sometimes very good in special, uh, some special fields. So as a parent, as a doctor, we will tell the parents to keep looking about uh, this thing that the baby is, if the baby is skilled in specially, uh, especially in something. And we should also make them aware that there are schools which take care of these kids and uh, 
so so they, they basically broadly our counseling should be in two parts one is the breaking the news and second is that telling them that these babies they need regular follow up examination and a multidisciplinary system a multidisciplinary team of doctors should be looking after these babies and third is counseling them them a little bit about the, their long term course that how they are going to live and how they are uh, special in these things thank you, thank you dr uh, ma'am you take over from here dr so uh, uh, dr tamkin uh, this is uh, something which is you know uh, very important that does screening only entail termination what have you to say about it? <clears throat> uh, that's a very difficult question uh, whether we should screen or not perhaps uh, science can give us this answer but what to do once it has been confirmed uh, I think it generates many questions and more questions for parents as well as clinicians. The social, the emotional, the healthcare implications, the philosophical arguments against termination. Is it better to be dead than to be disabled? Are we promoting eugenics or designer babies? Any uh, you know risk of having an, any abnormality and the parents go and abort the baby? And then of course the question, what is normal? Hitler, who was morphologically normal, chromosomally normal, or uh, Stephen Hawkins or Helen Keller, they were normal or abnormal. Then, of course, uh, the pro-life arguments, the right of a parent to decide whether the baby should live or not, or is capable of life or not. Then the legal aspects that I uh, earlier mentioned, you know, the parents lit 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 litigating the doctor for wrongful birth or the general children now also for a wrongful life. So basically, this, these are very complex issues with no right or wrong answers. It is the parents finally who have to take the call and we all only can be there to help them by being with them and respecting their decisions, not being judgmental at all. If they decide to continue, we should remember the mission of the fetal uh, society for fetal medicine, offering every fetus an optimal outcome or every baby, in fact, an optimal outcome. So I don't think so there can be any right or wrong answer. Uh, so difficult for us to decide for the parents. Very beautifully answered, Dr. Tamkin, and very sensitively you have taken up this issue. I just have to ask, uh, add that, you know, decision-making of the parents is, dependent on many things. So one is the medical aspect, the severity of the disease, what is going to be the life expectancy. But besides that, there are so many other aspects like social aspects, how the baby will be accepted by the society is again a very big question mark. What is their economic background, which, is, uh, which has a huge impact on their decision-making? Uh, then they, there is another facet to it, that what is the availability of uh, you know, special facilities to support the care of these babies. So uh, on this forum, I just want to know that uh, are we prepared? Are we prepared for all these things? Are we ready from the following perspectives like society, the political perspective, the economic perspective? And is it not the time to address that? Uh, Dr. Chanchan? Yes. Yeah. So we thought that at this juncture, we will. This is a perspective written by an American physician. She herself was expecting a baby, and their, their conditions might be different from ours, but the human perspective remains the same. So we thought we would highlight that. That this 36 year old second gravida para one, uh, she had opted to do an NIPS, which came back as high risk for Down syndrome. And this is what she had written that some argue against prenatal inequality screening if it is not going to change our plans to continue the pregnancy. However, as a couple, having the knowledge of our daughter's diagnosis as 14 weeks was a huge benefit for us. It allowed us to work through the grief before her arrival, connect with local resources, plan for her delivery locally, and establish a fantastic support network. So that instead of being overwhelmed with the news in the postpartum period, we were able to enjoy our beautiful baby girl. So as Dr. Tankin beautifully put it out there, that it is 
no two families will be the same no two parents will be the same we the, the onus of decision making is on them and they have their families to support them and whatever decision they take must be respected without being judgmental about it so is screening accessible to all straighter doctor there i think dr tankin very nicely yes. put it across in 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 her in her points but uh, Dr. Jair, uh, yeah, uh, I, think, uh, I think, I uh, think, yes, uh, uh, we have already uh, emphasized the fact that one size fits all does not work in our society and in our practice, and we have to acknowledge this. There are two facets to this issue. One is whether we are able to provide it to all, and that is in terms of quantity. Number two is what we provide to all. Is it genuinely what we actually aimed at? When I work for a government service, I realize that many of the NT screens which are coming to me, those ladies have gone to an ultrasound practitioner. They have come to a forum where a NT scan has been desired, advised to them. But when they get back with the results, I realize that without an NT image at all, at all, a combined first trimester screen has been generated and has been reported as low risk. So these are two different arenas that we have to work on. Saying that it is not possible to have it offered to all probably is not the solution. It, it should always, always be a lofty ambition. We don't achieve 100% any time, but we don't forego the aim and the you know, ambition of achievement. So that should be our aim. And in a government setup, yes, bending backwards three times over, we are able to achieve it. It is possible to achieve it without spending crores of money on it. It is possible to achieve quality assurance if each of the practitioner working for it aims to personally do it. It is possible to achieve it. And the other way around, whenever there is a report which is dubious, it is important to look into the finer details and counsel appropriately, document appropriately for the sake of not just the patients, but also the clinicians who are involved in this process. That is the briefest possible view. Dr. Chanchal, can I just add something here? Yes. So this was one perspective with respect to the infrastructure one has. Uh, there is another perspective to it, I think, for which this panel was actually uh, taken up. That, uh, you know, I think it is very important to assess what is the understanding of the woman about this test and do we really empower her by the counseling we do? And despite our counseling, can she actually absorb and realize and make her choice. So again and again, uh, uh, the role of counseling, pre-test counseling is very important, not only from the perspective of imparting scientific knowledge, uh, but also to make sure that this goes through her understanding, which I think is again a huge barrier in our country with the kind of uh, literacy rates we have here. You take this question on? Yeah, Chancha, please. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you've, you've yeah. given us a broad outlook. As clinicians, I mean, once we have a baby who's diagnosed with Down syndrome, uh, what can we do better for these children? Because I think Rima used a very nice line that these children can be groomed into uh, achievers in different, and as you also mentioned, that some of them may be very good at certain things. So uh, what can we do better for these, these children? Yeah. So uh, I think as a clinician, the one of the duty which I, I think most of us do is taking care of their health problems. But also uh, understanding the familial and the social aspect is very, very important. Providing the family adequate counseling, providing them with the emotional support, guiding them to the through the way, arranging like uh, the follow up visits for them in which they should not be, there should not be so much hassle that they are going to several places that uh, then at the time when the child is uh, growing, uh, like uh, at every visit, supporting them that and telling them that, that, okay, your baby is doing good for this age. Don't worry, this will come up, this will come up. And uh, following these kids appropriately and then guiding them to the schools also and talking to the talking to the teachers. And eventually as a clinician, I think as uh, like this year, 
fetal medicine society is there making the country specific guidelines so that the government initiatives sh should come and right now the schools they are although they are, they are in the public setup only but if they are they come in sorry they are in the private setup most of them but in the public setup also domains if more and more uh, schools and more and more like then the families they will not feel that their kids are just the odd ones out and the society will be more and more uh, aware of the of these kids that when they have come to this world then they should they should uh, live a normal life as they uh, so so this is what as a clinician we can do from the uh, apart from the aspect of taking care of their health so uh, dr kurana the next question comes to you i think you have a lot of influence also in this perspective that as policy makers, what can be done for the Down syndrome children so that their lives can be made better? And unless we cover this perspective, our women are not making their choices. Uh, probably they're undergoing screening under compulsion. So how to, what can help overcome this so that the women really exercise their choices and their rights? Yes, thank you for this question. Um, not that I have too much of an influence on policymakers. If I did, then there would be three straightforward things I would do. A, I would increase the health budget to ensure that everything we need is available at every place because an unhealthy nation cannot be a progressive nation. And um, that is at a very broad level. At the most specific level for what we're doing today, we have to make sure that every option is available. The first thing is that currently, the only test approved as a prenatal uh, diagnosis uh, is actually the mid-trimester anomaly scan, and nothing else is recommended apart from the usual hemoglobin and stuff. That we cannot, with our current infrastructure, manage to add on this counseling and to carry out these tests because we don't have personnel, we don't have equipment, we don't have training, and we don't have the money and that we need to sensitize the government at all levels, uh, and each one of us needs to do that. Which means that first of all, if they tell us <clears throat> that we must carry out these tests, we must tell them, look, give us the resources. The resource is very simple. If they say that, look, this is just not frequent enough, and one in 650 or one in 830 at birth is not frequent enough, well, thank you very much. Why don't you just add PLGF? And we will screen for something that is a much more frequent condition, and that is preeclampsia. And one of the advantages of preeclampsia screening will be a Down syndrome screening. So if that logic hits us, that's point number one, and that's the one I am trying to push at a personal level. The second thing is to make sure that women come at the right time, and therefore, as a society, we have to make sure that they have the education to say, that it's not fifth month to, promote, to reach the hospital, but as soon as you know that you're pregnant is the right time. And then we stratify care for the 12 week scan and so on. The third step would be that you have to set up a sensitivity which tells people that even as professionals, we need to be aware of the fact that the individuals will be different. We then have to accept that and move on to making sure that every time a Down syndrome child is born, that child has the resources, both in terms of money and in terms of opportunity to be equal to the rest of society. This is after we have told them that a Down syndrome testing is not going to cover up all aspects of a mental uh, uh, disability. So the first thing we have to do is to realize that some of them will have to go only to schools that cater to children with, with, uh, with special abilities, but most importantly, integration into society is necessary. And since the vast majority of private schools have also been given free land and, and, and less cost land, then this integration should be available everywhere. So the economically weaker section should be strengthened in all schools, private as well as uh, public. The public school itself should also have enough facilities to make sure that we do it at the convenience of the parents. And this means that the physical rehabilitation where necessary for the hypotonia, <clears throat> the rehabilitation that is necessary for speech, and the vocational rehabilitation should go on at the same time. 
We should also make it necessary that corporate social responsibility extends to employment for those with disabilities. And the fourth thing that we must understand is that we absolutely should not stop using words like disability. A disability is a disability is a disability. If I soften the word, the individual loses perspective. If I soften the word, the government lose, loses perspective and the world loses perspective. We cannot soft pedal ourselves and say they are specially able. No, they are not. They need a disability that has been looked upon by society as something different and we must accept that. And this is something that we always try to soften. There is a thud in life. We're going through some horror stories here in life and we have to make sure that this thud is very, very specific. And if we don't get that shock, we'll never be shocked into action. And so we have to stop using these politically correct terms. These are children that have special needs. They have additional needs and it is our duty to provide them. So this is where we stand at the moment that each one of us needs to work. Those of us who work on behalf of the government need to do this. The ones in public health need to do this. And every single individual within the medical profession needs to fight on behalf of our patients all the time. The fourth thing is that educational programs for the rights of everybody, the child who has a special need, the mother who has a need, the family who has that need, has to be handled. And therefore, we must make sure that public awareness by public messages on every single private channel needs to go out in social media. And this is something that we need to do again at a more uh, national level. Thanks. Um, just adding on to the booking in the first trimester, in fact, we have sometimes made proposals to the uh, policymakers in the ministry that uh, they can add some intense, uh, incentives to the ASHA workers who get the women for antenatal care rather than gifting them at the second. If they incentivize these women to get the women in the first trimester, maybe that can be a big way forward. Uh, and that will not just help us to capture these uh, women who are likely to have Down syndrome, but much more uh, with the perspective of preeclampsia as well. Because now we can prevent it if we start aspirin in the first, first trimester. True. Yeah, so uh, I think this has really been a very uh, uh, vibrant discussion. Uh, we have looked at many aspects of screening. Uh, uh, there are a few take-home messages which we would like to summarize at the end that, you know, before we do the screening, uh, this uh, counseling has a very important role and it should be factually correct. It should be non-directive. And I think it will be worthwhile giving the couple and the family some time to think about it and then come and do the testing. And it's very important to keep on asserting the role of uh, uh, false, the uh, concepts of false positive and false negative. Uh, screening versus diagnostic tests should be uh, stressed again and again, lest there is a situation when a woman goes and terminates the pregnancy just on the basis of a screening test. Uh, that's again very important. And uh, of course, we have to respect the parental autonomy and the choice of the family as well. Uh, uh, Dr. Chanchal, would you like to take forward from here? Dr. You Chanchi, unmute yourself, Chanchi. Sorry. So, uh, we, we, I think we've uh, very elaborately covered all this, that diagnosis is not synonymous with termination. And what we wanted to emphasize on was that you offer information and support, information leaflets in local languages, genetic counselors, because the clinicians may not have the time to go into, uh, to spend a lot of time counseling parents, support groups, for example, the Down Syndrome Federation of India, it is one of the most uh, actively involved organization. In, in, in our capacity, we can provide families who've been diagnosed recently with, uh, we, we can get them in touch with families who have children with, who are affected with Down syndrome. And if you go on the, on, on the web and the Down syndrome foundation, it is replete with success stories of Down syndrome kids walking as uh, models for ramps and, this particular boy who works as a chef. And I, I found this very um, uh, very touching that what he's written is judge me as a whole person, not just the person you see. 
accept me for who i am not for not what i look like most important just be my friend as i would like to be yours i also have unique strengths talents and abilities so please treat me with respect and the, the list is non ending people achieving different these kids achieve very well they just need to be groomed into that together we help this world become more beautiful and our key message for this panel was integration thank you very much i would like to thank all our panelists thank you dr sangeeta ma'am so, uh, on behalf of uh, uh, society for fetal medicine thank you very much for being there yes i would also like to thank and i think uh, this panel would be incomplete unless i acknowledge all the hard work dr chanchal has put in to compile these cases and these slides and of course thanks to dr khurana and society of fetal medicine and all my esteemed panelists for obliging us at such a short notice thank you so much thank you mom thank, thank you everyone thank you everyone thank you. but don't go away as yet we have some very very uh, interesting questions in the chat box and okay. we need to address those to read for some of the messages we are not running short of time as yet do we ever run short of time at sfm no we don't we will answer as many of these as possible and may i request uh, dr sangeeta to take these up one by one and dr chanchal to assist her we'll request uh, uh, them to address these to specific people amongst us and then we will give a brief but uh, fully uh, full of information answers Uh, so there's a, a question from Dr. Debashati De, Debasmita Manjal. My question is of little out of context. Now evidence showing Pape has low efficiency as a marker for preeclampsia than PLGF. So should we add PLGF and SFLT as surrogate marker for preeclampsia in first trimester screening? So uh, Dr. Chanchal, would you like to answer yes. that question? In the first trimester, it is true. See what Sir meant was when he said that. Uh, Uh, let's add PLGF, and as a bonus, we'll get additional. Uh, we will improve the detection rate for Down syndrome. That's what he meant. And you're right that the PLGF is a more. Uh, uh, it has been found to be more sensitive. In fact, adding PAPE did not make any difference to the detection rates, whereas PLGF did improve it when added to uterine artery uh, PI and the traditional things that we do. So split. it is not known to help much in the first trimester because the other parameters do achieve a much higher detection rate at at a much higher specificity so i think what so this is what you meant when you said placental adding placental growth factor because that is something which is just a blood test you don't need to train hundreds of people and in addition you get an improved detection rate for down syndrome apart from screening for a much more common condition if sure. yeah So the next question is: If there is an absent nasal bone uh, uh, in first trimester screening, and the combined test gives low risk, where the nasal bone has been entered as unknown, can we really offer NIPT because waiting till sixteen weeks and look for nasal bone later will increase the anxiety, uh, provided of course the patient can afford it? So there is a case. Let me summarize it again. that the nasal bone is absent the combined test gives a low risk but the nasal bone entered here is unknown so can we really offer nipt because waiting till 16 weeks uh, will cause lot of anxiety to the patient so uh, first of all i would like to say that if the nasal bone was seen and it is absent i think one should uh, go back to the lab and get the risk reassigned that's the first step to do rather than you know doing nips and uh thinking of doing a scan again at 16 weeks i would like to have the uh, opinion of other panelists also and dr reema is also there to um... hey, dr sangeeta if uh, yeah am i audible yeah yeah you are yeah, yes so uh, yeah so uh, if we have an absent nasal bone in the first trimester obviously the uh, the biomarkers which were sent uh the result always should have incorporated the absence of nasal bone and then given the final risk so uh low risk the, we have to see the adjusted risk the result may be low risk but whether it is higher or lower than the background risk is important secondly 16 weeks is a good time to reassess the nasal bone because that is the time we be able to readjust our risk but however if the patient is not able to wait 
and wants a definitive test and is ready to spend money, NIPT is a good option. Patient can go ahead with NIPT and can stay, uh, I mean, uh, rest assured that the baby does not have downs at least uh, and not wait till 16 weeks. I think and that's maybe, not a bad option. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody has any other comments? Any other panelist has any other comments on the case? So I think all of us agree that the first step is to reassign the risk with the correct information in the software. That's very important. Mm -hmm. And of course, I would have loved to see the films also before I, uh, what is the quality of the scan done? That's another important issue in this. So thick and NT over 95th centile, ideal time for amnio for such cases. So ideal time for amnio would of course be 16 weeks and on. Uh, and- uh, yes. So, uh, many parents choose to continue T21 because suppose. <laughs> There's a question that if Mosaic 21 delivered, can they sue the clinician? They can sue the clinician for anything. Yes, but see here, if you have done a good pre-test counseling, you have yeah. done a good post-test counseling and your cons ideally your counseling should also be, you know, a written informed consent that will protect you. So I think a very important thing is that you do a good counseling and you please record it and it should be signed. It should be a written informed consent for doing a screening test even. Ma'am, recording, see, we work in the private sector, but recording consultations can be quite tricky and we are still not doing it. No, no, How no. A consent to do the test. Okay, right, right. A consent right. to do the test, screening test also. True, yes. Yeah. A handwritten written record is actually yes. as good as yes. a video record. Yes. And yes. Um, uh, But a video record would be an ideal situation. I, I, I didn't mean to do recording yes. because... Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's not practical, right. but we do have now CCTV, which is present in all our private clinics because we're so scared of getting beaten up. Uh, because that's the approach to society, to the medical profession, we're the softest target for their uh, for their frustrations, and they think by attacking us, they will be able to improve on that. Uh, ideally, yes, uh, use the CCTV cameras to record this or a cell phone. Otherwise, even a written informed consent. Mm -hmm. I would be good enough inform it's not the consent that is as important yes that is important too but at least that we say that yes they have seen this information they've understood this information and are then making their choices so one very important thing i think which is missing in our patients and our practices is that the all the owners cannot be on the clinician true the parents have to take certain decisions. I mean, we can tell them NIPT is 99%. It is not 100% test and amnio is 100% test. But after that, it has to be their call. And the clinician cannot be held accountable for that. I think that is something which is very important for, and that's where the guidelines, the Society of Petal Medicine has put out guidelines for the anomaly scan, for the invasive testing. And that is the importance of those documents that once I know I've done my job well. Yes. Then, then that's that, and there's a society which is backing me with that evidence. I think that is very important. Yes. So, which also answers yes. a, a, a Fiona's question on on what to do for the thickened NT over the 95th centile. Mm -hmm. uh, we technically always take 99th as our cutoff, but we do know from Cate Bilardo's group that between 95 and 99th centile, there's going to be a fair degree of. Uh, uh, of Down syndrome, but there's also going to be a large degree of other non-Down syndrome problems. So invasive testing for these needs to be considered and patients can be then made to opt and let them decide on what they would like to do with those statistics. But the statistics are very straightforward that yes, 95 to 99 centile of a nuchal translucency would definitely have a significant number of abnormalities sitting there, a Down syndrome and others. And we could uh, ask the patients to decide what they would like to do, whether they want invasive testing at the time of the first trimester, whether they would like uh, to exclude at least the Down syndrome part of it uh, by 99%, or whether they would just like to wait until 16 weeks and then take a decision on the basis of, uh, uh, of whatever test we decide to offer them then. So next question is previous baby T21. Do we really offer invasive or for, or for NIPT? and do parental karyotype to rule out balanced translocation. So Dr. Ranjana, you have answered that in the chat box. Could you just uh, speak it out for the benefit of everybody once? 
Uh, I think Dr. Ranjana is not there probably or is she muted? Uh, she's back. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ma'am, uh, can I get the question again? Sorry, I just so, missed it. Ranjana, uh, you had already answered that question yeah. in the chat box. I answered a, a few. about serious few. baby with T21. Should we do invasive? Should we do NIPT or should we do a parental karyotype? Okay, uh, yes. So here, ma'am, uh, since the previous child is, uh, uh, is uh, I don't know whether this uh, means that they have not done a karyotype, which is a basic requisite. Uh, you have to rule out, you have to know whether it's a free trisomy or it's a translocation trisomy. So if it's a, first thing is that you do the karyotype of the child uh, to know whether, which, which type of uh, trisomy you're dealing with. If it's a translocation trisomy, only then you need to do the parental karyotype. Uh, coming to this question, whether we can do a I we think she's the Ranjana. She has lost. lost the connection. So the, the crux is that the parental karyotype, the, the which type of trisomy 21 in the affected child is needed? Yeah, so it is uh, pure trisomy 21. You counsel them that the recurrence risk is 1% above the age related background risk and discuss the NIPT vis a vis amnio. And if it is a balance, one of the parents is a, a carrier of a balanced translocation, then one would be one would prefer an invasive testing rather than an NIPT. Dr. Varandugal is writing that if NIPT was to cost same as the dual test, what would you recommend? I think we would all recommend the NIPT and the ND scan. Any differences of opinion here? Uh, not a difference of opinion, mm -hmm. but the fact is that if we're used to spending a lot more money and it comes down to a lot less, and in fact, we're pretty much approaching NIPT being the same cost as first trimester screen biochemistry, mm -hmm. um, uh, we do understand that we would miss out on some of the predictions for the rest of the pathology of pregnancy. Obstetric. The great obstetric syndromes. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. warning for preeclampsia, warning for fetal growth restriction, mm -hmm. warning for the other gestation hypertension disorders, uh, warning for HELP syndrome. And uh, these, these we would miss out on. So it may not be such a perfect stratification of healthcare. So mm -hmm. really it's a very small amount of money. It is equivalent to a family eating burgers and, uh, and chips. Uh, because really, uh, that's the cost today of first trimester screening. And it is only a mental concept. And believe me, uh, oh, doctors seem to believe you're a poor nation. But most people, even in the villages, would be able to afford this kind of thing. Yes, daily wage earners, etc., may not. And they need to go to the free hospitals. For the rest of us, it's public perception. Uh, a small amount of money, such as two or 3,000 rupees, is peanuts compared to what we spend on social occasions. So let's stop talking about ourselves as a poor nation. We are a, we are a poor nation full of very rich people, the vast majority of us. And the small amount can be looked after by the government. The rest of us will jolly well forego uh, two family outings and cover the cost. Mm -hmm. So that's what we need to do. Um, uh, there's one very interesting question, Chantal, if you could answer that. It's on the validity of first trimester screen. Do we go by the days and weeks? Or do we go at a crown rump length of 45 to 84 millimeters? We go by the crown to rump length. Yes, and, and in case your, your company makes noise about it, don't go sending samples to that particular organization. Mm -hmm. Just send it to someone who works intelligently. Another question is, if NT is thickened, do we still do screening tests or should I directly send them for invasive? So I think we have all discussed that this should be directly taken up for invasive testing. Yeah, yeah. So second gravida para one, full term normal vagina, normal delivery, current pregnancy had mid trimester growth restriction. The combined screen was low risk and post delivery down was proven. So no sonographic markers were there. Is mid trimester growth restriction a criteria for invasive testing? Any of the panelists, Rima, anybody who wants to answer this? Just growth restriction per se would not be an indication for invasive testing. Mm -hmm. But yes, if you have very severe early onset growth restriction, less than 24 weeks, mm -hmm. and if you have no other marker, the liquor appears good, the Dopplers are good, there's no evidence of uteroplacental insufficiency. In that case, I would be a little skeptical and mm -hmm. could offer it to our patient. 
because I had a patient like this who uh, was early onset severe growth restriction. We did an amniocentesis at, at 26 weeks. It wasn't down, but it was trisomy 16 and there was no other marker on ultrasound. So at least you can prognosticate your pregnancy as far as the mode of delivery is concerned. That yes. is the only thing that makes a difference in uh, when you want to do an invasive testing when you have no other markers for Downs. So growth, growth restriction which presents before 24 weeks. 24 weeks. I yes. think we, we should discuss invasive testing, not what just because the of common in in these situations. Ma'am, it is yes. the patient's choice. I mean, we, you, we tell them because in growth restriction, one would rather prefer an amniocentesis because yes. of the added advantage of picking up micro deletions and duplication, which would be more contributory rather than. And maybe, maybe one should keep a small sample as a backup. Because to, you here. may have to do some infection infections. may show ultrasound features later in such an early onset growth restriction. Mm -hmm. So, and next question, uh, Chanchal, will you take yeah. up? Yes, ma'am. Primary 26 year old, dual marker negative, and nuchal scan normal, choroid plexuses in the level two. How to go about further counseling? I think this we need to address. Who, who would want to answer? Jaya hasn't spoken for a long time. We can't let her fall asleep. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So this is a primary with a combined first trimester screen low risk. And the second trimester scan is offering a choroid plexus cyst. We need to emphasize here that a good combined first trimester screen performed appropriately offers us a very, very uh, good detection rate with a very, very acceptable false positive rate. And a choroid plexus cyst is a very, very weak marker for Down syndrome, especially in isolation, in the absence of any other markers. So I would really like to emphasize whether the rest of the markers are negative or they have not been looked into. That is an important bit of information I want there. But yes. having said that, choroid plexus cyst in its own right is a weak marker for Down syndrome. So CPCs are not associated with trisomy 21. The only aneuploidy tri they're associated is with trisomy 18, which would present with something or the other. And because the ultrasound detection rate is more than 90% for trisomy 18, the only difference here would be the CPCs, which are large, more than yes. one centimeter yes. and persistent. They would need follow-up, not in terms of aneuploidy, but in terms of they may cause, because practically if you have a CPC, which is more than one centimeter, that means you also have mild ventricular megaly. So yes, that in fact, completely different. In so, fact, we had a personal experience where we published it also that uh, there was a baby with huge choroid plexus cyst bilateral that persisted late uh, also into the second trimester. And there we offered invasive testing based solely on that finding. But they were extremely striking, bilateral, not resolving. It was a different picture altogether as to from a vis-a-vis -a, -vis a normal choroid plexus cyst which just comes and goes very, very tiny. So then each case has to be individualized. I but the general message is that CPC should not yeah. be something that it's not something to worry about. Yes. I think we are There's done. One more we question uh, we had missed from some uh, from Dr. Deepak Vashne. Ji. I did two for, uh, first trimester screening in last few months. One fetus had normal nasal bowl, but she had one down baby. I advised her for amnio that is positive for downs. Other lady having fetus with UNB, what does UNB? Unossified, I think. Unossified, amnio done result negative for downs. Can we rely on an unossified nasal bowl? It's a combination of things. Which I think we have already discussed it. By any, if when we talk about the detection rate, when it takes it from many factors, all the individual parameters, then only do we touch the detection rate of 89, 90%. So I think everything must be put together. A number arrived at and then further testing. And one last question, which has, I think, just come up a minute before. Suspected trisomy 21, amniocentesis done. CMA and QFPC are advised. CMA report comes normal. What chances of detection of translocation or mosaic downs with a normal CMA? CMA sh uh, uh, should CMA no, CMA should be integrated with karyotyping to pick up this type of scenarios. Should CMA be integrated with karyotyping to pick up this type of scenarios? Doctor Ranjana, yes, ma'am. That's at the far end of the chat, Doctor Kurana. Okay. Last, yes. 
Is, is Dr. Ranjana available? Please, ma'am, I'm there. Somehow I'm not able to uh, come on video. Uh, I have rejoined after I momentarily yeah. got disconnected. So coming to this, uh, coming to this question, ma'am. Uh, so this is a suspected trisomy 21, uh, where the amniocentesis has given a um, amniocentesis done and CMA has, and TF PCR has come as normal. So uh, the question is, well, what are the chances of detection of translocation of mosaic downs with non-normal CMA? So here I want to say that um, a chromosomal microarray uh, can detect an unbalanced translocation. So what we are uh, talking about is trisomy 21, which is an unbalanced uh, chromosomal aneuploidy. It's an unbalanced situation, uh, which can be very well detected by a chromosomal microarray. There is no um, chance of uh, uh, unbalanced Down syndrome going undetected. Now, uh, coming to the mosaic uh, trisomy 21. Now, this situation, uh, say, um, um, there is a limit to um, limit of mosaicism, which can be detected by uh, a CMA. So uh, in general, we say that up to a mosaicism, up to uh, say 15%, 10 to 15% can be picked up as low as 10 to 15% can be picked up by a chromosomal microarray. So it's a good, um, uh, I mean, it's a good test to advise. And these are the situations we generally don't encounter while ordering a chromosomal microarray uh, for a suspected Down syndrome. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Dr. Ranjana. Thank you, Dr. Ranjana. I think thank with that, finish the questions. Yes, thank you very much. This has been an absolutely fascinating session. And um, the good thing is that we've been able to combine science with reality, science with humaneness, science with patient options. After all, today we do understand that whatever we do, we do for our patients, and it is the patient who has to make the final decision. The excuse of the story we hear at the end of a lot of stories is, uh, but doctor, what would you do if I was, or if you were in my place? And the question is, never mind how many times the patient says that, I think it's important to say that, look, I am not in your place, mm -hmm. and um, I will never be able to understand your situation uh, the way you understand it. So please, if you want a little more time, do that. If you want another counseling session with a second person, please do that. And please make your own decisions. You're old enough, you're mature enough. Also, the fact that we should not generally presume that a literate patient is always very sensible or that a non-educated patient is not so sensible. They all have a degree of understanding that we can help. And uh, we do need to cultivate our counselors in a much better way. We need to push that and we are planning to do that at the level of the Society of Fetal Medicine. Counselors are open, uh, uh, have an open membership with us. There's no problem with that. But importantly, we realize that we need to push that at a national level so that we have enough genetic counselors. We know that the era of, uh, of genetics is, is, is right there now. Uh, we're right in the middle of it already, it's not something in the future. And therefore, we need to strengthen our counseling much more with professionals because most practicing obstetricians will not be able to do this. And we have to share that duty. So, on that note, thank you very much. My thanks uh, to Dr. Bimansani and Dr. Mohit Shah for their suggestions for this particular thing. My thanks to, uh, to uh, Dr. Sangeeta Gupta and Dr. Chanchal for putting together the panel discussion. And my thanks to Dr. Rima Bhatt for that very, very wonderful session. Uh, on, on the introduction to the scientific aspect of screening. I'd also uh, like to mention the inspiration uh, behind finalizing this program was the one that we're doing actually tomorrow, uh, where a lot of our SFM representatives will be present in a FOXI program. And for those of you who wish to tune in, you will find information on the WhatsApp groups. It's organized by Dr. Sita Ramamurthy, who is head of the FOXI uh, Committee for Genetics and Perinatal Medicine. So on that note, uh, thank you very much, everyone. And thank you to the panelists for being here. Good night. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Thanks. so much, everyone. Bye. Good night, Good night everyone.